Hello once again everyone. Uh, apologies for the change in scenery as well as the delay in videos this week. Um, we had to shut down the school for a temporary quarantine. I'm still feeling fine, which is good. Um, and as far as I know everyone else is as well, it's an abundance of caution. But either way, I was delayed and so I'll have to be filming at my home for a little bit. So apologies if the camera is slightly crooked or the lighting isn't perfect. Doing what I can. But either way, um, Rapier has been proceeding quite successfully and as such, I've been getting questions about voids in particular, because when you start reading the rapier sources yourself, the pictures aren't necessarily all that exciting at first. Then you get to the big drastic voiding actions and you're like, yeah, I want to know about that. So I was requested to do a video on some of the voids, specifically about the uh, Jurata or um, the Imbrocata as depicted in plates 17 and 19 of Capifero's treatise. So I will be addressing those specifically, but I'll also be referencing some others here and there and going over a couple bonus voids. So first and foremost, what kind of voids are we talking about? What is a void? A void is when you do not utilize the sword to defend yourself and instead are moving the body out of presence, usually in a lateral capacity, um, though you will also sometimes see in a vertical capacity, or even sometimes you'll see voids where I'd simply lean my body back, where I pull my body back. There are some um, where I would be bringing my head down to one side or the other, and it is often recommended that, for example, when I thrust going over into um, Secunda, second, that I bring my head down and away from my sword, so that way I am bringing my head further away in case he goes over. And likewise, when I'm attacking into Quarta, I'm doing much the same thing. So there are little voids going on. There's also voiding of the legs, which I have a whole video on, uh, one that I'm still quite a big fan of, where I just simply bring my, my uh, leg back. I have even seen people, uh, specifically Tom Leone, he had his front knee bent, uh, someone went to cut it, and he just straightened it and voided while thrusting the person in the face at the same time. Excellent timing, but all that is to say, it's really moving your body out of the way instead of dedicating time to defend it with the sword, which of course opens you up to use your sword in an offensive capability. Now, while this is great, there's some important things to consider as to why we're doing the motions and when to do the motions. So to start off with the most commonly used one and the most commonly seen one, we're going to talk about the Jurata, uh, or also known as the Imbrocata. Now, You'll see a bunch of different terms used here and there, depending upon region. But basically, it is a void in which we are going to move either the front foot or the back foot offline and void our body toward our right side. So, plate 17, which is going to be the use of the front foot, uh, dictates that we are coming up and we're finding our opponent's sword to the outside. So what I've done is I've approached in Terza and I've found the opponent's sword over um, their left side, essentially. Now this causes them to cavazione and try to attack me on this line, so on the inside of my sword. Now, what I do as that happens is I'm going to pick up my front foot and I'm going to step out obliquely, and at the same time I'm also going to turn my foot inward. Now what I'm doing here is I'm essentially making it so that way I can take weight onto it. Certainly I could still just put it out here and try to lean, but as you see, I'm going now onto my heel and I can't properly stabilize myself. So I'm going to step out and put myself kind of onto the ball of my foot. Now how far you need to go is debatable. Um, the image seems to show he's stepping about, yay, um, so just a little bit off to the side. And what also makes this particularly easier to do, because um, it's going to take practice, don't get me wrong, but something that helps a lot is making sure you are back weighted and making sure that your foot is going back at a 45 um, at least because if I'm standing in a more neutral stance, this becomes a little trickier, versus if I am back weighted, it takes nothing for me to move this foot out of the way, and I can do it very quickly. So, I found the sword um, in terza to the outside, in comes this thrust, I'm going to step out, I'm also going to lean my body back and open it. So, the image shows his hand being out. I tend to cast my arm out as well for balance. Now, where I'm gonna put it can vary, you certainly don't want to leave it here, though, because it's going to get stabbed. So I tend to raise it up, which also helps open my chest, and I'm just sinking my weight onto that front leg. At the same time, I am simply going to wound him um, in the tempo of his cavazione. So, altogether, I'm here, he comes underneath. Now, as he's coming underneath, that thrust is about to come up, 
So I'm going to move my body out of the way and simply extend my sword into Corta. Now, I may hit him, I may not, but the important thing is that if he tries to thrust at me, he has to one, get past my guard, two, he has to track me with his point, which is significantly more difficult than you would think, because he has to come all this way around. So the blue line is currently representing the place we were standing. His sword is still in line with that. So for him to hit me, he has to come significantly farther. Now, the important thing to remember about this is that this is much like techniques where we, for example, outrun a zverkau or similarly shortened cut, a cut that comes more horizontally. We have to make sure we're going in the opposite direction of it. So what's happened is we're causing him to come from the inside line. Specifically, he's attacking into Corta, which so from his perspective, if you were the one voiding, he is doing that, right? He's coming under and then attacking. Now, he can reach a decent ways over to the side, but only so far. That's about as far as I could attack without needing to turn my hand over, which is a likely response if you parry the sword. Some people will meet it and try to turn over to reach you. In which case, I need to make sure that as I do this void, oh, wrong one. <laughs> as I do this void, I am stepping well out of the way, and if he tries to reach around, I can shorten back to defend myself if I have not him, or alternatively, I can just bring my foot with me, and now I'm in an entirely different line than he was in. Now, preferably, we strike them in the tempo of the void. As we hit them during their cavazione, they can't stop themselves from coming forward because their mind is going, my sword's been found, dip, go. And we hit them during that. But that's the first one. The second one, much the same thing. Once again, they're going to be cavazioing around our sword after we found it to the outside and coming on this inner line. And the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on that is because if you try to do this with them coming this way, if they're coming in a relatively straight line, you can still escape it. But generally, I don't want to be going this way if the sword is coming from here. If you're fighting a left-handed person, especially, that is something to consider. But I'll get back to that again in a moment. But against a righty who's coming in corta, Stepping out this way, either with your front foot or your back foot, as I'll explain how to do in a moment, gets me away from where they're going. Now, the second version of this, uh, the jurata, or sometimes referred to as the imbrocata, with the rear foot, is a little bit more grandiose, and the one you more commonly see. You don't see this one used a whole lot, um, outside of some really, really talented people, um, or I've tried to use it a couple times, but either way, this one's the one most people use because it's a much simpler motion to do, and it feels a little safer because you're making a bigger motion. So once again, what happens is I find my opponent's sword in terza to the outside. They come in to take this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my left foot and I am going to step back and out to the side. Once again, I cast my arm back, which opens my chest and I simply extend in with the thrust. Now, the important thing to note is that the image shows him stepping almost in front of his other foot, so he's gaining ground with the passing step. You will see this here and there um, in different kinds of footwork. So for example, um, sometimes in Paulus Hector Meyer, sorry, not Paulus Hector Meyer's, Joachim Meyer's um, source on quarterstaff, he will have you void in place, essentially. So I'm just moving my back foot out of the way, but I haven't gained ground. And he'll do that on both sides. Or sometimes it will be, I am gaining ground, to then move off of it again, or what have you. This is one of those situations where, even though the image shows us kind of gaining ground, you can kind of do whatever you need to do. Oftentimes, I find that when I use this void, I step just straight out. Um, so now my foot is still on the same line it was before, but I have gained a decent amount of ground. Sometimes, um, and I'll talk about this again in a moment when we talk about variations, if I am attacking lower, I will go ahead and step a bit more forward because I am now trying to void slightly more of me. But overall, I would say it's dependent upon what you're doing specifically. However, the image does show him stepping up much further. And another thing to consider is what you're physically capable of. I have very flexible um, tendons and stuff, thanks to, and very flexible ankles, thanks to practicing this for a while and not doing much else. That is not particularly hard for me to do. And if you look, I've got my foot relatively turned. That's not difficult for me to do. However, if you find this is is difficult for you to do, then rather than stepping forward, which does put more pressure onto this, I recommend you simply step out 
which puts less pressure. If your foot turns a little bit, it's not the end of the world. This is preferable because now I have a more grounding and I can use my foot to push off. This, I lose a little bit of pressure and I lose a little bit of balance, but it's not the end of the world. So be willing to modify things and also understand that we are training for an ideal. In the moment, it's probably not gonna look as pretty, but anyway. So to review that action, we find their sword to the outside in Tiazza. They come underneath and start attacking against us. We're going to step out with our back foot and extend, hitting them at the same time. Overall, pretty simple. And again, as a note, you don't want to stay there. Just like with the front one where we stepped out, we're going to just pop out. Then we just bring our foot over and we're once again in line. Now, this one, our weight is on our back foot, which you would think makes it harder for me to move it. Not necessarily though, since what I'm doing is I'm going to straighten my leg and push that hip offline at the same time. It's actually quite easy for me to get myself out of the way to varying degrees because I'm using that stored power. Now, this swarm of Durata appears both, and it actually appears in pretty much every rapier tree. I think it even appears in Destreza. I'm not familiar with Destreza though. Um, however, you will notice that while in Capifero we're wounding at the head or the throat, when you look at Fabris, the granddaddy of them all, most of the woundings are taking place down into the stomach. Now, the reason for this, and another thing to consider when you're using your Jiratas or, or choosing to use a void in general, is that Fabris is much more hand parry heavy. So Fabris's stance, rather than being back here, is much more forward and the hand is held much uh, more extended and utilized a lot more. So, as such, the Jirata is used in place of um, defense because what's happened in a lot of these actions is either we're attacking at his open place to get him to move his hand over to defend himself, then we need to go around that hand, or alternatively, they are trying to defend with their hand and hit us at the same time, in which case we now have to free our sword. Now, these are particularly useful devices to be aware of because there are people, and I am guilty of it, who are over-reliant on their hand parries, be it with a dagger or without a dagger. So these types of people will often keep their hand a little bit more forward, their sword a little bit more withdrawn, and be more ready to utilize it in combination with their attacks. So when this happens, the important thing to be aware of is that getting your sword tip around their hand is your priority. If I do not, then I'm not going to be able to give them any offensive threat and as such, they can work with impunity. Even if I get my sword free, if I don't get it on them, they'll just keep coming. The other thing to consider is that in the tempo of me getting my sword around, my, around their hand, I will be unable to deal with their incoming thrusts. You could try to kick your guard over or something along those lines to desperately defend yourself, but you once again end up in, in German fencing, we call it the Nach, and it's a really bad Nach. You're not going to have opportunity to do anything. He will simply redouble his attack and come after you again. So, this is where we utilize the Jirata slash Imbrocato once again to get ourselves out of the way while at the same time dealing with that hand parry. So, what's going to happen is if we're taking the more Fabris style stance, that you can certainly do it up here, it doesn't really matter. Um, as they go and try to defend by pushing our sword one way or the other, and he has three main actions with this. Uh, one in, both the latter two involve us fainting at certain parts of his body to draw his hand out then moving from it. The first one has them attempting to defend with their hand and we're going underneath. So we're gonna go with that one first. So what's happening here is we found the sword, he's coming in and trying to push our sword out with his hand in this manner. So he's coming at us and doing this. We're going to go, since, we, uh, since he came over here initially and got us to try and defend, and then he's gonna move his hand against us, we're already over here. Uh, which is a very common thing to draw people out to do. He's now put his hand right about here, which is preventing us from just bringing ourselves back online. So, since we're already up here and this thrust is coming in, we're going to cavazione around the hand, but since we have to go around the hand, which is much easier for him to move slash drop, it's also pretty big, we're going to make a relatively large, almost mezza cavazione. So mezza cavazione being where you go halfway through rather than all the way around. We're going to go past his hand to his belly, and at the same time, we're going to step out, which ends up with me basically in the same position we were in before, but now my hand is much lower. Now, this one is particularly useful, even though it's a simple action to go over, because what it's utilizing is you've been drawn out by a feint. You see that they're going to block you, 
you get the body out of the way and you shove that sword forward on the low line. Now this one is one where I would recommend you go ahead and step a little bit more forward as opposed to just out to the side. Reason being, um, a lot of the time people who utilize hand parries like this, so he faints and then goes here, they're going to really throw themselves in because they feel a little bit safer. As such, you want to go ahead and make sure you get that stopping power onto them because you're going to hit those hips in the gut. They're going to get stuck like that. And it's really good versus if you're fighting someone who is a little bit more cautious, who's kind of lunging more like this because they do feel more secure, you're going to need to cover that distance to hit them. So either way, going a little more forward, nice thing on this one. Now, the other situations in which this occurs is we are going to be fainting at them. And it's two different hand parries. It's drawing their hand either below the sword or above the sword. So what happens is essentially we're still in the same stance. We faint high to get him to move his hand across. And as he's moving his hand across, so his sword is right here, we're going to drop our tip between his hands. So we faint, drop, and then we step out of the way of his thrust coming forward. Because what he's trying to do is he sees that thrust coming in and Fabris describes his hand is relatively withdrawn. So he only has the option of parrying with his hand as opposed to using, because he can't really use his weak to defend here, right? So in comes that thrust. He's trying to do this number and just jam us down low. We're going to move our sword right between this little gap here. And then we're gonna hit him as he's coming forward. So we're in our stance. I see he's relatively withdrawn. I faint, drop, and just step out of the way once again. Again, relatively simple, but it's getting around the hand parry. The third action that he shows us is attacking down the opponent's hip. And what this is provoking, so it's on his right hip. So he's out here, we're fainting down to this line, so he's looking to push this across and attack us in this manner. This one's a little trickier to do. So we're in stance, we faint, we see that hand start to come across, we drop once again around, though sometimes you may also find you need to raise over their hand. Just depends upon what they're giving you. So relatively complicated motions are happening uh, with the cavazione, but the footwork isn't really changing. It's always gonna be us voiding our body out of the way to get around their hand parry and avoid their sword, since we can't dedicate our sword to defending it. Now, you can use your hand to defend their incoming attack, but these actions happen really, really fast. Um, so that is a thing to be aware of. So either way, that's the Jurata slash the Imbrocata. What other voids do we have? We've got a couple. So one of my personal favorites that doesn't usually get talked about as a void is the passing step. Now, you might say, well, it's not really a void. It's, it's in place of a lunge, but it's not. So difference between a passing step that just comes forward and a passing step void is where my foot is going to end up on the line, right? And this is a modern differentiation that I'm making, even though it's hinted at. So if I just pass forward, usually as a way of grabbing the opponent's sword or something along those lines to launch my attack, I am basically passing forward in place of my lunge to cover that distance. Nothing really crazy there. Usually this is utilized if I have an offhand weapon or alternatively, we end up kind of bound up. I come forward and seize hold of their guard or their hand or something along those lines. It's great. The passing step that is utilized um, in plate 18 of Kappa Pharaoh, however, the one right between the two voids we just talked about, is instead much wider and much more to the side. This is the passing step I much prefer to use, um, mostly since Closing in with rapier is always a little bit dicey because people's fingers can get broken, and also because it does void my body out of the way. So the way this particular play breaks down is that we're here in our stance. We're going to feint at them to the inside to get them to raise slash counterattack. In that tempo, we're going to dip underneath. Then we're just going to step out wide to the side and thrust over their arm into their head. When you nail this one, it feels so awesome. But we are eschewing um, use of the sword, defense of the sword, in favor of reach and voiding our body out of the way in case they come forward. Because as Capifero ex explains, there should be no parries in ideal fencing. If someone's coming at you, you attack into it and you hit them by guarding yourself that way. So assuming that's the case, right? If I faint, he's going to try and counterattack, right? So by dipping underneath, I need to really make sure I'm no longer where I used to be. And he also describes we are thrusting into Quarta. I'm ending up in Terza out of habit. But if by turning into Quarta, I'm also not 
moving my true edge to defend myself in any way. So I'm really banking on this getting me out of the way. Now my actual stance when I do this, again, relatively simplistic, feint. I'm opening myself up rather grandly. This I find helps with balance. It also helps get my body sort of in line with where the sword could be. So if I'm a little more square, a bit more of me to hit. If I open, I'm a little more profiled. It helps me push this hip forward, which in turn allows me to take a bigger step. I am loading my front foot a little bit more than my back foot because following this, I just bring my foot up and I'm ready to stand again. But I would classify this as a void. And it can also be used just purely on offense or sometimes on defense. Um, against left-handers, I often find that if someone is trying to thrust over this quickly, I can step out of the way to utilize a thrust while running away from their sword, much in the same way we did this against a right-hander coming from this way. So if I'm fighting someone and they're coming in, especially if they're using a dagger, if they're coming in from this side, I pass forward, which allows me to get a lot more reach, I outrun their sword, and if I turn into Secunda here, I can defend myself quite easily. So that is another void that doesn't get talked about a whole lot as a void, but it's a really, really good one. Now, one of the final voids that I want to discuss is one that you don't... Okay, you do see it quite often um, as like the big showpiece, but it's not used very often, and that is the Solta Bolta. Um, I've also found an article referring to this as the Night Thrust, as in night as in time of day, not as in um, rank. I don't necessarily know how valid that is, but their justifiable reason being it is, according to some source they cited, I didn't go that deep into it, I was mostly just looking for the spelling, um, they de described it as it was popular to be used in darkness or near darkness. I can certainly see its application in that regard, but I cannot confirm that, but I thought I'd mention it. So the Salta Balta is a fun one, because we talked about voiding laterally, now we're going to talk about voiding vertically. Obviously, I can't void up that way, though if you think about it, if someone cuts through my leg and I lift it, that is somewhat voiding vertically. But in this case, we're going to be dropping ourselves. So what happens here is a thrust is going to come in directly at my head, and I am going to kick my foot out in a rearward lunge and lower my body down at the same time as I extend my sword, usually into secunda, though you could certainly just throw it forward in quarta or terza. But what's going to happen is in comes the thrust, I'm just going to drop myself down and land my attack. Now, the finer details from the side, right? The rearward lunge part is really important because if I try to lower myself going forward, I have to transition my weight. Even if I'm in a relatively even stance, I still have to transition my weight forward. And by moving into the attack, I'm of course shortening the amount of time between the blade going into my forehead and me clearing it. So I'm instead going to kick my leg out in a rearward lunge, which as you see, forms exactly the same as if I was doing a normal lunge. And I'm going to bring my body down by tightening my core. So now I'm essentially leaning over where my, if I had a third leg would be, which then becomes my hand to balance me. Now, strictly speaking, I can get pretty low without putting my hand down, right? And this is still fine. But if I can get all the way down, I'm now at my own knee height which is much preferable because I'm way harder to hit that way. So, strictly speaking, if I wanted to, I could achieve the uh, Solta Bolta by just lowering myself. And I have done so. Um, you also see that action used in Messer. Uh, you will see people will come in with a cut or something along those lines, then they'll simply drop themselves very low. That is still a perfectly valid action, and I would still describe it kind of as a Solta Bolta. But... In this case, we're trying to get as low as possible because we're more on the we're on the defense. We're not on the offense. I'll talk again about that in a moment. So, one more time. I'm here. In comes the thrust. I kick out my legs. I lower myself, and I just keep my arm up. This one, preferably, you land your hit at the same time. If you don't, recovery is going to be a little bit tricky, right? So I lower myself down. At this point, their sword should be over my head. If they try to cut. I'm going to just have to pull back to cover and do a lot of hoping. I have gotten out of the situation before. I cannot recall the exact specifics of it because I was internally screaming the whole time. So bear that in mind. But you do sometimes see these voids being used in an offensive capability. And I want to talk about that. 
So mostly it's because out of all the actions you learn, these are ones that relatively stick in your mind, right? They're gross motor mo motions, motions? I keep saying that. They're gross motor motions that are really cool. And so you want to pull them off and your brain is like, hey, it moves you out of the way. Why would you not do that, right? However, on the attack, they have some pretty significant disadvantages. So in regards to the Jirata, I see this and I've done this, where people will, they're kind of running out of options. They'll try to lunge while stepping to the side. And as you see, like I talked about already, I can gain ground. And certainly, you know, if I'm in a more mobile fight, throwing that out to just get some lateral motion does kind of work. The problem with it is you're particularly vulnerable in that tempo. If they're not coming forward at you, you stepping out here basically means that there's a giant target right here. And when you're fighting against the Jirata, so if I'm stepping this way, you need to be, so if, I, if we now switch roles, if I pass forward, I can account for that movement very easily while staying on the outside of your sword. So left passing steps, like the one I described, they can kill Jiratas, especially if you catch someone who is using the Jirata not as a void, but as an attempted attack. So that doesn't really work out all that well, not to mention it has no power, right? A normal structured lunge, everything is lined up behind. So when I find the sword, or even if I don't find the sword, I find the sword in the course of attacking, everything is really strong right here. If I try to do that while attacking, my core, my power is moving away from the sword. You might get lucky. You might just jab them as you're moving, right? It's exactly the same as just throwing a punch while you're going. I'm sure that was terrible. But the principle is the same. Sharp thing, moving at you. However, outside of very specific lucky instances, I don't find it to be all that useful. The left passing step, again, can be very useful and can even be used offensively, as we've already gone over. But you don't want to rely on it, right? If I start just passing all the time on my attacks, what happens is, in the tempo of me trying to bring this foot back up, there's a great window to attack. Not to mention, if someone parries my sword down as I'm passing, I am now forced to either try and step backward with a cut, or to step forward with a cut. Cuts with these, even though this is um, my side sword, with a rapier, my cut would be even slower. They take a big tempo and they're not that difficult to defend. There's a wonderful picture from Alfieri of a guy attempting to cut him and he just stabs him square in the face because in that tempo of me bringing my sword around, it's open season, right? All you need to do is land a thrust, not even necessarily a great thrust, just a quick one, and then deal with the cut as it comes around. So bear that in mind. Now, the last one, the Solta Bolta, this is one I've seen attempted to use offensively, both successfully and incredibly non-successfully. So in the case that it was successful, was actually at a Bowie knife fight. Um, it was during WMAW two times ago, maybe three times ago. Either way, it was a Bowie knife demo and they were going against each other. And one of them drops down very, very sideways, more sideways than I think I can actually achieve. But he did it as he moved forward. So rather than being in line, if you look at this from the side, he's more gaining ground in this manner. Now, it was very unexpected, and due to the length of the Bowie knives, which were about yay long, I think, he covered a lot of ground very quickly, and his opponent could not really do a ton against him. Unlike with a sword, he couldn't just crack him in the head. The only thing he could reach was about the wrist, which if he had tried to cut it or something along those lines, certainly would have worked, but it took him by surprise. And so in that regard, it was used effectively. Do I think it would have worked every time? No. Do I think it was a really good idea in that exact moment? Yeah, it worked well for him. Um, and also, of course, it was very, very cool looking. So he won the brownie points off that, but either way. So that was the time it was used successfully, but there's context with it. The time it was used incredibly unsuccessfully was actually against me. Um, one of my guys, we'd gone over it, attempted to use it as an attack much in the same way. So rather than doing a rearward lunge, he came forward and lowered himself. The problem with this, as I've said, is you can just lower your point as they go at you because it's a lot easier to track versus dropping as the attack is coming in, you dodge it. So he attempted to do so. All I did was stay in place, block the sword, grab the sword, whack him in the head. Because once you're down there, there's nowhere you can go. And if you can stop the sword from going anywhere, 
it's extra bad. So all that is to say, those are some interesting rapier voids that I wanted to talk about because voiding a rapier just is really fancy and really cool. Um, and when you apply it in the correct place, it can be a very useful tool. The trick to remember is that whichever side you step to needs to be the side the sword has the longest time to get to you, right? And this is true for any other weapon. If the cut or whatever is coming from this way, you are safest going the other way um, with whatever action you're doing. The other thing to consider, of course, is don't rely on the super special move. If you try it a lot, you are practicing it, but you'll become known for it. It's one of those things I recommend you do repetitions of against some either you know very willing partner who isn't going to be fencing you regularly, or alternatively, you know, with a teacher or something along those lines, someone that you're not testing yourself against, then use it on other people, or alternatively find some sort of uh, synthetic way of doing it. Uh, I have seen people use tennis balls on a string. They'll push it, rearward lunge, step back up, things along those lines. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of good boxing advice um, that could probably help you quite a bit. But either way, utilize them in the moment when everything seems correct and when it's in line with those sort of advice uh, and those situations, they'll work well for you. You try to force it though, with like any other technique, it's not gonna work out all that well. But either way, very long video, but I hope that was helpful. Um, and I'll be going over some other techniques another time.